This is Nightline with Sarah Bradley. Kia ora, good evening. A teenager has hacked his way into the confidential information of a string of high-profile victims. Good morning and welcome to the show. Now we're going to be continuing Christchurch coverage with extended bulletins from One News on the hour every hour. Is there a risk that you won't be able to do the film now? We'll have to see. I don't want to give the producers the impression that I'm sitting waiting. waiting. <laughs> Kelly Osborne is here. My goodness, what a ruckus you have created and all this attention. How do you sort of keep yourself together and keep yourself composed? Well, I've learned the hard way. I've done a couple of things where I've been like smelling my armpits, see if I smell, and then it's ended up in pictures everywhere or I don't sit with my legs properly closed. Sarah Bradley reports. Air New Zealand engineers were angry and despondent despite only a fifth of the expected layoffs so far being confirmed. The remaining engineers will learn their fate in February, with the 110 laid off today finishing work within a month. They will receive a redundancy package and their unions say they'll look at whether those who want to stay can be redeployed within other parts of the company. Sarah Bradley, 3 News. Geoffrey, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah. Did Barry Humphreys ever come to visit you in prison? And if so, did he dress up as Dame Edna? He did come because he's a close friend. And close friends did not desert me. They stood by me. Shane has got a whole lot of projects on the go, including a bit of professional poker playing. But you like the races as well, I guess. Yeah, look, it's always great fun at the races. All right, everyone, it's time for our GM chat of the day. And you may have heard yesterday that Richie McCaw, who's the captain of the All Blacks, has declined a royal invitation to the royal wedding. He's Do you understand why he's totally turned it understand. down? Whereas someone like me, who's not into sport, just thinks, oh my he's goodness, paid. it's a chance of a lifetime. I want to um, finish with nudity, which we always like to do on this show. Well, we kind of started with it. <laughs> well... <laughs> 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 to discuss, I'd like to welcome Willie, Jane and Barry. And we've got Willie in the flesh. There you are. And I was just it's saying... It's not a pretty sight. <laughs> no. It is not, you look better on television, yeah, Willie. Thanks for doing. No, do you know what? I was just saying to Willie, he's so much taller. <laughs> and, but John Tamahiri, not so much. Hi, I'm... Oh, so that's like I made you laugh so much. I'm crying. Brilliant stuff. Michelle says, I ring my phone to see where I've left it. When I find it, I get so excited because I've missed a call. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so 13 pounds is, is a big baby? Well, yes, hefty. You, yeah. you, it doesn't happen. Yes, that, oh. that mother's not walking again. So yesterday, the Prime Minister announced an emergency six-week financial relief package. The big question, though, is, is that enough? It's, it's a first step. Helen is back in New Zealand to perform in Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, and he's here in Wellington for the beginning of the season. Great to have you on the show, Sir Ian. Thanks Thank for joining you. me. Lovely to be here. So you, you were instrumental in getting this tour of Waiting for Godot to New Zealand, I understand. It wasn't in the original plan. It's what I do for a living. I, I, I persuade people to come to New Zealand. <laughs> But now they've all seen Lord of the Rings, they don't need much persuading anymore. But uh, the actors in this uh, show hadn't uh, been to New Zealand before, Roger Rees and, and uh, Brendan O'Hay and Matthew Kelly. And I said, well, you're going to meet the nicest people in the world and the most beautiful place in the world. They said, OK, we'll come. Um, so you're coming to New Wellington for a few we days? We're in Wellington for six performances, starting on Wednesday night. And then uh, we have to go back to Sydney, where we've been touring in Australia, because it was such a hit. So I have to go and do another week at the Opera House there, and then we're... Then we're going to Christchurch for four performances the, the week after that. Yeah, at, the end, at the end of the month. Mm. Now, you've described this Waiting for Godot as a bit of... It's quite different from the way it's been performed before. Why is that? It's got a very bad reputation, Waiting for Godot. When it first came out 50 years ago uh, uh, in New Zealand, as well as everywhere else in the world, people found it rather difficult. Uh, looking back, you wonder quite why, but uh, one of the problems for them was that it, it was in two acts rather than three. Uh, in, in those those all plays had three acts, even Shakespeare. But Beckett decided, no, we'll have a, a play that's just in two parts with an interval. Even something as simple as that seemed to um, disturb people. And, and, and then when it didn't seem to have a story that, that came to an end, they were puzzled. But then, uh, you know, life doesn't come to an end, does it, until you die? And then it ca carries on for other people. So <laughs> there's, there's nothing odd about this play now. But I think what Sean Mathias, the director, and, and the actors have done is to take um, 
the play at its face value, and Samuel Beckett calls it a tragic comedy. And it, it is funny. There's something amusing. If not for the participants, the people who are overdoing the waiting, there's been some terrible holocaust, and the, they, they don't have anywhere to live, Dee Dee and Gogo, and uh, they, they don't have any money, they, and they don't have enough to eat. That's not funny for them. But as we see them complaining about their feet and their short-term memory loss and, and um, gamely getting on with life, Sitting back in the auditorium of the theatre, we can uh, smile and sometimes laugh out loud. They seem to have been a song and dance act, we decided. That seems to have been their past. They've known each other for 50 years. And so we took them at their face value as real human beings and perhaps revealed some uh, more light-hearted side of Beckett than people had uh, realised before. And, and that's the way it seems to have worked. And, Wherever we've done it, I've, I've done it over 300 performances now in, in London and on tour in the UK and through Australia. Uh, it's a wonderful mix. Get people my age coming to see it and then uh, kids. And there was a seven-year-old in Melbourne who confided it was the best play he'd ever seen in his entire life. His entire seven years. <laughs> now, you mentioned Sean Mathias is directing. Yes. And this is an ex-partner of yours, but yes. from 20 years ago. And from what I understand, you are friends with a lot of your ex-partners. How do you manage that? <laughs> I don't have most that many ex-partners. Most of us don't. But, uh, <laughs> well, you shouldn't throw away your... your a relationship that's been good simply because it changes uh, doesn't mean to say it, it has to end. I did that with the, the first person I lived with. I, I lived with him for eight years and we separated and we didn't see each other for 20 years. A total waste that was. 20 years wasted. So uh, Sean and I, when we split up, decided that we wouldn't, uh, we would carry on seeing each other and more than that, carry on working together because uh, he's one of the great directors as far as I'm concerned. He tells me the truth. and. Uh, He's the most diligent of people. Here he's on this tour. Most directors wouldn't, wouldn't tour with actors. They'd no, be they on don't. to their next job. Mm. He's seen this show he's a, about every third performance. And, and so we're constantly rev reviving uh, uh, what we do and uh, re-rehearsing and, uh, I suppose, getting the production mm. better or deeper in some way. And so, no, he's an ideal director for, for this. And he's got a wonderful sense of humour, which is uh, appropriate for Beckett. Are you seeing anyone at the moment? You mind your own business. Well, I don't know. No, there's, ask. No, there's, no, there's, no, there's no time for shenanigans when I'm here. I'm <laughs> Are you working too busy? hard. Good gracious me. <laughs> Let's talk about The Hobbit because yeah. you will have obviously you will obviously know that Guillermo del Toro unfortunately had to pull out as director uh, due I've been to conflicting. I'm staying in his house, but you mustn't make anything of that. You mean he's in, not there? He's, he's not there. <laughs> He's in Los Angeles <laughs> He's at the moment. <laughs> so his house in, in Wellington. I was hoping when we came that, mm. that I would be uh, to, to New Zealand that I would be staying on after Christchurch to 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 to, to start the, the Hobbit films. Uh, but as you know, they've been delayed, and I have no news to give you uh, except that uh, an announcement is imminent. But what it will be, I, I genuinely don't know. It'll it'll either be that we're going ahead or or, or that we're not. If it is Peter Jackson directing, which is what is being mooted, and you know we're just assuming that, how different do you think the film will be to what Guillermo would have done? Oh, I, I can't anticipate that, and I, I think it would still, if, if that's the outcome, but be some sort of collaboration because Guillermo uh, has um, participated in writing the script, uh, and I know. Um, done many of the designs, but always in collaboration with, with, with Weta and, and, mm. and Peter Jackson, uh, who, who is a, a producer, after all, and one of the scriptwriters. So I think the del Toro influence will, will, will be there, but I, I really can't anticipate. It, there have been delays. Is there a risk that you won't be able to do the film now just the same way well, as Well, I'm Guillermo? not under contract, and, and uh, my time is running out, and uh, I'm enjoying working in the theatre, and Frankly, I, I would like to race after doing Waiting for God to get on with doing another play, but uh, we'll have to see. I don't want to uh, give the producers the impression that I'm sitting waiting. Waiting. <laughs> Only in this play are you waiting. <laughs> now, theatre is obviously something that you're really passionate about, but you have done so many incredible films. When I was reading about you last night, doing a bit of research, you know, Gods and Monsters, that wonderful uh, play with Will Smith. Um, oh, you know, six degrees six of separation. Degrees of separation. Yeah. When you look back at all the film work you've done, who have you most enjoyed or been most impressed with acting against? Can you pick one actor? Oh, these questions. Um, I say William Hurt, uh, who I did a, a, a little film with um, 
I called Never Was. And you really have to scour uh, the internet to find that. Uh, it, it was a wonderful film and had a very starry cast indeed. Uh, but I, I long admired William Hurt and, um, and we got on extremely well. We were filming together in Vancouver uh, and he's got a wonderful sense of humor and, and, and a, a, an absolutely um, adamantine professionalism in, in the way he works, which I, I approve of. So when he turned up to see Goddard <clears throat> in London, I was thrilled to meet him. And then when he turned up again to see the play, and a third time, and when we were in uh, Sydney, came a fourth time to see the, the production. Mm. And, and it's one of the actors I most admire. Um, that was very satisfying. That must have been such a thrill for you. You were knighted in 1991. It said that the first sort of actor of your generation to get a knighthood. It wasn't just for your acting, though. It was very much for your activism to mm. gain equality and gay rights. How much is that still a part of your life? Or do you think you've sort of achieved what you needed to achieve in that area? Uh, well, any civil rights movement will tell you that uh, the easy part is changing the law. It doesn't seem easy because you, you have to persuade people, but at least you can argue the case. And, and, and uh, when it's a matter of treating people equally, we're all born equal and we should be treated equally by the law. And that principle is, is increasingly understood. Not entirely, uh, but uh, New Zealand has led the way mm. Uh, mm. in that regard. And um, pretty well now in, in the UK, the laws are in place. The bad laws have been repealed and they've been replaced by good ones. However, you, you've then got to achieve what you might call social equality. You, you, you've got to persuade everybody that the law is, is the change in the law are right and, and that old prejudices should die like old laws should die. And that's a much more difficult job because prejudice comes from all sorts of places, uh, from, from people who don't realize that the world has changed and, and, and that our knowledge of human nature and, and, and human beings has changed. And so it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing uh, question and, and something comes, in some cases, a problem. And, and, and uh, when prejudice turns into violence, as it does mm. sometimes in the streets of London, I, one gets very exercised and, uh, or indeed, all over the world. So uh, we're in a state of uh, flux, and, and flux and, and change with regard to gay rights. And uh, although the story may be pretty well over in, in New Zealand and pretty well over in the UK, go across Africa, it gets very dodgy indeed. So there's lots to be done. Well, it's wonderful to have you in New Zealand again. Thank, Thank you very you. much for bringing this play. No, and I'm delighted to be back. And it's great to have you on the show again. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Bye-bye. International best-selling author and former politician, Lord Geoffrey Archer, joins me now from Auckland to talk about his 16th novel, Only Time Will Tell. And this is the first in the Harry Clifton Chronicles. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah. So how many books are you planning or have you already written about Harry Clifton? The, only the first one, Only Time Will Tell. It's the first of five and will go from 1920 to 2020 and will cover the life of Harry Clifton in a period of 100 years. He's a boy born in the back streets of Bristol in England and he's the son of a docker and his family assume he will be a docker until mm. at the age of seven they discover he has the most magnificent singing voice and his whole life changes and volume one of the five volumes takes you from 1920 to, 20 to, to 1940 when he wins a place at Oxford and has to decide whether he will continue with his degree or whether he will go to war. The way you've written the novel, which is an interesting way, I mean it's not an, a new way, but you, you write about the same periods but from different people's perspectives throughout it. How hard is it to make sure you've got all your T's crossed and your I's dotted as you write <laughs> yes. a novel like this? Yes, that is, that is the challenge because if you're going to write the first part of the section, and it's only a small part, in the first person, what actually happens is you, you move the story along with each people. There's seven people in this book who really matter. Mm. There's Harry, his mother Maisie, there's his uh, would-be father-in-law, Hugo, there's Giles, his best friend, there's Emma, there's old Jack Tar. And as the story moves along, you actually follow it through their eyes. So they bring you up to date on what you think you've seen. Mm. They answer some of the mystery that is there, 
before the story moves on. When you, so you're planning in 100 years of this chap's life. I mean, assuming he has a long life, obviously. When you're writing, you've written the first novel, are you, do you already have an idea of how this whole series is going to pan out? That's a very fair question, Sarah. The truth is no. <laughs> uh, the, when the first book was finished, my secretary, having read it, she was the first human being to read it, she said, well, what happens to Harry now? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I have since then written the uh, first draft of the second book. And all over India and Hong Kong and now in New Zealand, people are stopping me in the street saying, yes, but what happens to Harry? What's going to happen to him? And I have to say, uh, either I don't know, because that's the cleverest reply, or I'm not going to tell you. But well, it's we, been fun. And we, the real challenge will be with five books. And I frankly haven't got a clue what happens in book three, four or five. But then I'm not a writer, Sarah. I'm a storyteller. And it says on the back here, that, you know, number one bestseller, but the, the greatest storyteller of our age, probably the greatest storyteller of our age. So when you, when you say you're not a writer, what, you need to be able to be a writer to be a storyteller, don't you? Uh, you need to be both. But a writer is someone who probably has a very good education, a tremendous command of languages and well read. The gift of telling a story is like being a ballet dancer or being a painter or being a singer. It's something totally and completely different, and it is a God-given gift. If you can combine it with writing, then you're both. But I've always looked upon myself as a storyteller. I was slightly embarrassed last year when the French gave me a major literary award, and when the London Times rang me and said, well, you're no longer a storyteller, Geoffrey. Uh, now you've won a major French award. And I said, no, don't tell anyone. It'll <laughs> harm the sales. <laughs> Now, in addition to being a politician, you also have an infamous period of your life, of course, which you have written about extensively when you did go to jail. What I want to know is what kind of people were you in jail with? Was it sort of white collar crime? You know, who did you mix with when you were in jail? It must have been such a bizarre situation. Well, it was fascinating at one level because one met a group of people one would never met before and indeed picked up some amazing stories from which I was able to write mm. the three prison diaries. And I think what it taught me, Sarah, was how very privileged and very lucky I've been to have the life I've led, never experiencing drugs, never experiencing a bad upbringing. Mm. And it really brought home to me that I was a very privileged person and I came out more aware of how lucky I've been in life and indeed touched by how the public all over the world and indeed in my own country stuck by me. In fact, the sales of the books went up, not down. And I suppose I should say at this point, because uh, if I'm going to do a plug at all, it's for something much more important for the uh, earthquake in Christchurch. Mm. I've been invited by the Dean of the Cathedral here in uh, Auckland to address uh, them tomorrow at 7.30 in the Cathedral and all the proceeds will go to the Christchurch earthquake. So I hope if there's anybody watching this who'd like to come to the Cathedral tomorrow at 7.30, that's Saturday, tomorrow at 7.30, I will be addressing them on, on books and other things and all the money will go to that very important appeal, but in particular for the cathedral in Christchurch. Oh, look, that's wonderful to hear you doing that, and we really do appreciate it as New Zealanders and as, as do those people in Christchurch. Now, you men mentioned that after you got out of prison, your, the sales of your books Sarah, went... can I just say one thing? Sorry, yes. I apologise, because no, you, you raise a very interesting point. I want people to realise, because I became aware of what was happening in Christchurch, sitting in England watching a television. I want you to realise that if there's ever been any doubt about the affection between the British people and the people of New Zealand, you wouldn't have been any doubt if you'd come to England at that time. You led the news mm. day after day, both in the newspapers and on television, and I realised there and then that the affection that what has always been between these two great nations was just as strong as it's ever been. That's wonderful to hear, and my sister lives in uh, London, and she's been there for 15 years, and she said the same thing. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you're probably aware that Prince William is actually in Christchurch. Yes, he seems speak. to be doing very well. He's doing well, isn't Mind he? Mind you, we lose rugby matches when he comes, so we won't <laughs> <laughs> send him home. We don't want to lose any rugby matches. <laughs>
Look, look, getting back to my question, and we actually have a photo here, you said you received so much support, even having been incarcerated, mm. obviously, and your sales of your books went up. And you've had a couple of high-profile supporters, uh, Margaret Thatcher is one, and also Barry Humphreys, uh, and I think we have a photo there, as Dame Edna. When Did Barry Humphreys ever come to visit you in prison, and if so, did he dress up as Dame Edna, or was it... What's his other character, the one who's the sort of... Beer swilling Australian. Les Patterson. Oh, yes, uh, somebody. Yes, yes. The <laughs> or did arts he just minister. Come, yeah, or did he just come as, as, as himself? He did come because he's a close friend. And close friends did not desert me, they stood by me. Barry came to prison to see me and, of course, caused a riot within the prison, as you can imagine, because everybody wanted to say mm. hello to him. But good friends don't desert you. And one of the most touching things, I mean, this is 10 years ago, of course. One of the most touching things was that when I came out, I worried that I might lose some friends. And I was delighted that when I sent out 400 invitations to my two Christmas parties, that only six people out of 400 turned it down. So I'm very proud of the fact that my friends stood by me. That's a big part, actually, of your first novel in your chronicles, The Friendship, The Friendship Between the Three Boys. How much of your novels is based on yourself, even just from a character development perspective? Well, I think in Only Time Will Tell, because it is going from 1920 to 2020, and I was born in 1940, so the second book begins with my life. It's slightly autobiographical, mm -hmm. and I bring in human beings I've met and come into contact in my life. I find always that if you write about people you've actually met and actually dealt with, it's more real. Mm. And people feel, yes, those are real people, Geoffrey, and I was able to empathise with them. So, yes, it is, I'm bound to say, slightly biographical. Well, look, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Congratulations on your first, no your first novel of The Chronicles, your 16th novel, in fact, Only Time well, Will Tell. And um, uh, best the, of luck with tomorrow morning at the cathedral. I presume you mean the Parnell... No, tomorrow, e no, no, tomorrow afternoon... At se tomorrow evening at 7.30. Oh, sorry, I thought it was in the morning. Gosh, thank goodness you No, no, you tomorrow me. evening at 7.30 in the evening. And thank you for your kind comments, because I've just heard a few minutes ago the book has gone to number one in New Zealand. So thank you very much indeed. Woo-hoo-hoo, and I hope everyone gets out and supports you and comes along to hear you tomorrow night, and because all that money is going to Christchurch. We do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And for more information on Geoffrey Archer and his new novel, Only Time Will Tell, please see our website. Air New Zealand has decided to go ahead with the axing of over 100 engineering jobs, killing off the department that services the engines on its wide-body jets. But it's held off cutting around 500 others after getting a counter-proposal from the union that both sides agree could save some of them from the chop. Sarah Bradley reports. Air New Zealand engineers were angry and despondent despite only a fifth of the expected layoffs so far being confirmed. Basically, how the management cock up, they haven't made up their minds what they want to do. No comment. 110 mainly Auckland staff will lose their jobs, their fate made more difficult by the specialised nature of their work. If they want to stay in the industry, they will really have to go overseas to do that. Uh, and if they want to stay in New Zealand, they are most likely going to have to leave the industry and do something completely different. The family, kids, house, the wife, mortgage, that's the um, first thing. And um, get on with it. Seriously, just um, get, it, get on with it. The Engineers Union says it's disappointed the 110 jobs couldn't be saved, but Air New Zealand agrees there is a real possibility that at least some of the 500 remaining jobs can be. We may not get to the full $48 million savings that the airline wants on that part of the proposal, but we'll get as near as damn it to it. And I think what we'll be saying to the airline is that there is... Uh, a value in having that work here. The airline says it will save $53 million over the next five years by losing the engine work done by the 110 staff whose jobs have gone. New Zealanders embrace competition. They're not prepared to pay a premium to travel on Air New Zealand because our engineering costs are higher than our competitors. So you do have to make tough decisions. Air New Zealand says significant changes would be necessary for the remaining 500 engineers to keep their jobs. It does mean changes to penal rates, to shift allowances and to overtime. The remaining engineers will learn their fate in February, with the 110 laid off today finishing work within a month.
they will receive a redundancy package and their unions say they'll look at whether those who want to stay can be redeployed within other parts of the company. Sarah Bradley, 3 News. An Auckland lawyer says a woman may have scammed several banks out of half a million dollars after an elaborate identity fraud. The scam is one in a series of mortgage hoaxes facing the industry. Sarah Bradley reports. This is the woman lawyer Don Thomas says came into his firm to get a mortgage using false documents, including a New Zealand passport, credit cards and a house title. Well-spoken uh, Caucasian lady, um, uh, ordinary New Zealand accent. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing at all out of the ordinary. Thomas says she secured a $180,000 mortgage from the ASB bank against a house owned by a woman with the name she had assumed. He believes she may have struck again. Caucasian, um, um, 30s, 40, uh, and that matches the description of the other two lawyers that I've spoken to who have been involved in exactly the same uh, method of uh, taking money. The ASB Bank confirms it lost the money and says it's working with police on the case. Don Thomas says it was a sophisticated operation, but his firm will change some procedures. The one thing that we didn't do was actually try and contact the lady at her home phone number because during the day people are working, they're out and about, mobiles and emails tend to be the norm. Uh, so yes, maybe we have to wait till the evening and try ringing people at home as a, for new clients as a verification. The latest fraud comes after a series of mortgage scams which has the industry on alert. We're not specifically making any changes to the way we do things. What we're cautioning our members to do is to take extra care in terms of the way they do things. Don't rely on you know, information that's not first hand or not original. The Serious Fraud Office will be prosecuting several alleged mortgage fraud cases over the next few months, involving a number of different types of scams and sums of money, some over $1 million. Sarah Bradley, 3 News.